This is one of the most recent encounters I've had. Last night was a cold one, even for South Carolina, and my friend and I had just come from downtown Charleston. Oddly enough, we were on the hunt for any unnatural things, hoping that we'd attract yet another set of terrifying or suspenseful circumstances. Suffice it to say, our wish had been granted. So, without further ado, let's begin. My friend and I had a long day, filled to the brim with fun and adventure, investigations and whimsical things. After we had spent most of the day in the downtown portion of Charleston, enjoying the frigid breeze and watching the rough waters roll against the docks, we decided it was best to head back before nightfall. Some time had passed and we eventually arrived back in our city of Somerville, but our appetite for the supernatural and otherworldly hadn't been sated just yet, so we decided to drive around and look at a newer town that had just been added close to us, the town of Summer's Corner. It was a nice town, sure enough, but the energy there had just felt weird. Atmospherically speaking, it was heavy and almost suffocating. That wouldn't deter us, as we're quite a resilient bunch, always moving forward, keeping a smile on our face, even if the circumstances are pure unadulterated agony. About half an hour into the drive, we discovered a street called Navajo Boulevard, which had immediately piqued our interests, as the name itself is similar to the Native American tribes of the Navajo people the exact people who hold within their traditions one of the most scariest entities to haunt our world, the Skinwalker. So, we start to drive down the road. It's dark and the energy there is thicker than the rest of the road. We had our windows down so we could truly feel the atmosphere and its energy, its vibrancy, and we were not disappointed. Immediately, we felt watched, not by multiple things, but one entity. This thing did not want us there, at all and we felt it come closer to us. Its presence was intimidating, quite malicious as well, and it put us on edge. Our eyes peeled and ourselves readied for whatever might happen next. The night grew quiet, all the noise ceased and the silence fell around the surrounding area. Where there had been no prior wind before, a heavy gust slammed itself into the side of my car and nearly shoved it off its left side. That's when we knew this was no mere entity. Just then, we saw a face in the front of our flickering headlights, grotesque, reddened with malice and spiteful things. Its eyes as pale and silver as the moon gazed into our souls, sending nothing but fear throughout our entire bodies. We were motionless now, ourselves shrinking into our seats as this abomination grew closer and manifested more into view. It unhinged its jaw and let out a horrific scream, much like from the first one I heard, of a dog's bark, a goat's bleat, and additionally, a fox's scream and an eagle's soaring screech. Enough was enough. I put the car into reverse and we drove the hell out of there. Unfortunately, the feeling was only intensified as we got back under the road and sped away. The intensity and dread grew ever more as it gained speed. Another gust of wind slammed into the car. Suddenly, my friend yelled for me to look out the window, right behind my seatbelt on the outside of the car. That's when I saw this awful thing in its entirety. Reddish, pale skin eyes that seemed to have no end, with goat and reptilian-like slits in the pupils. Two stubby little horns adorned its head, sprouting out from atop the brow ridge and rising just above its forehead. It opened its mouth and revealed rows of sharp, gnarled teeth. A hand with long, stained claws scratched at the glass, making a scream to high heaven. My foot pressed the gas pedal as hard as it could. As we were about to drive out of the neighborhood, the thing smiled at us and faded away the breeze scattering the leaves on the road against where it had been perched on my car's side. It was gone, but we heard a very audible whisper tell us that it'd be back real soon. Then it was quiet again, the heavy energy subsiding and gaining some neutrality as the night dragged on. All of this goes to show us, my friend and I, that just because we've experienced our fair share of unnatural things, and even more together, that there's always something out there waiting to show us more of the true world we live in the world that we share with these entities, beings that cross from their veil into ours. So I used to live in Northern Arizona in a town called Page. The town is on Lake Powell and nearby Horseshoe Bend, which are both massive tourist attractions recently. It also happens to border the Navajo reservation and has a population that is majority native I'm currently 18. I moved away less than a month ago, so I live my whole life in the town, essentially. 
I have heard stories, many stories from my friends, their parents as well, that these two stories are my actual experiences. The first story happened a year and a half ago. Since Page is a 60 mile drive from the next closest town, the nearby area is very popular among locals for jackrabbit, coyote, and bobcat hunting. This particular day, I was out on my own, pretty far back on some local dirt trails. Pretty recently after, I started hunting myself. My target was coyotes. This was before I had a call, so I had to look for them or bait them. And my firearm was a Springfield Saint AR-15, loaded with American Eagle 55 grain AP shells, which yes, is an important detail. It was probably around noon, and I had wandered down into the wash that ran up into and across the bottom of one of the sandstone cliff sides of the area. While walking through the wash, I scared probably the biggest coyote I had ever seen up the side of the cliff face. As it was scaling, I took three shots at it, and I was able to hit at least one because it started bleeding as it made its way up and over the top of the hill cliff. I gave pursuit and probably scaled the face in three to four minutes of winded climbing. At the top, the cliff turned into a flat mesa, covered by shrubs and dried up bushes, probably about knee high at most, with no coyote in sight. I started to follow the blood trail. After about 20 minutes of following, I was confused and somewhat concerned. The trail was still thick. Too much was being spilt to allow the coyote to continue in a straight sprint for that long, and I was hunting with the round that would drop a mountain lion in its tracks. After about 10 more minutes, the tracks from the coyote met up with the tracks from what I'm assuming were goat tracks. This is where I turned and got the hell out of there. Both of the tracks were recent, deep, and the sand was still loose enough to fall when I kneeled down to take a look at them. The tracks split from each other, the coyotes going far off to the left, and the goats going to the right. The blood trail, though, no longer followed the tracks of the coyote, but instead indicated that the goat had been shot. The tracks led down into another wash, known in the area for being bad news, so I got back to my truck fast after that. The second story took place near the outskirts of town and has a video that comes with it. My friends and I were out around 10 at night, near one of the local jogging trails. At the edge of one of these trails, a storm drain tunnel sticks out. We used to joke about skinwalkers using it to hide from joggers or bikers, but had never paid it much attention. This night though, we decided to go into the storm drain to see for ourselves. I of course was the first one in, and had five people behind me. We were probably 300 feet in when I heard what sounded like claws scraping against the concrete ahead of me. I could only see about 50 feet in front of me with my light, so I shushed everyone behind me. As soon as we got quiet, a moan resonates through the tunnel. I had never backtracked on all fours so fast in my life. The storm drain leads to a nearby road, which the people who were too scared to go into the tunnel were looking at, but they were not on the road or anywhere near the opening of the road, and were taking snapchats at the time of the noise, showing us that 1. It wasn't them, and 2. There were no cars on the road at the time. I can't prove these were skinwalkers but they definitely weren't any person or animal I've ever encountered in my lifetime. To start this off, I wanted to give some background information. I'm 14, female, and half Navajo. I've never been on the res and my mom and grandma never told me about these things. I'm pretty small and rabbit-like with how I act. Pretty much everything scares me, but given the chance, I won't hesitate to break someone's jaw. My girlfriend is 16 and mostly Russian. She usually puts herself in front of me to try to protect me if need be. These are important later on in the story. In my town, there's a plot of land that I believe that may have once been a golf course. I go to this plot of land with my girlfriend, we'll call her Casey, and my friends. This piece of land has become overgrown after no attention for a few decades, and is almost a plot of woods. It has long grass, vines, bushes, and trees. It's always full of life, too. Rabbits and squirrels in the spring and summer, deer, foxes, and raccoons in the fall and winter, and it always has blue jays everywhere. It was a really beautiful sight all year long. We call this plot of land Wonderland. Flanking Wonderland is a set of abandoned train tracks that goes all the way through the town. We call this the Deer Trail because we see loads of deer all along it every fall. In Wonderland, there's a small shed alongside one of the deer trails that we call the Devil's Toy Box, which overlooks the majority of Wonderland because of where it sits. 
Up on the hill is a circle of trees that we call the Ark, because we're big fans of Marble Hornets and needed a name for it. So hopefully this sets the scene for you. Again, all important later on. This happened sometime two years ago. It was about a week before Halloween and I was walking home from school. Casey didn't join me like she usually did because she was sick that day, so it was just me. The way I walk home usually takes me down an alleyway near Wonderland, so I figured I'd stop in Devil's Toy Box to rest. I popped down inside and sat my stuff down as well. I took a moment to look around Wonderland to enjoy the beautiful fall colors being lit up by the sun. Up on the hill, emerging from the ark, was a massive buck with these huge antlers. I just started to awe at the size of it. All at once, all of the blue jays stopped chirping, and the sun disappeared behind the clouds. There was a distinguishing stench in the air that I could only describe as burnt hair mixed with old dog crap. It was completely awful. I gagged and struggled not to throw up while the deer snapped its head and looked at me. The movement was all wrong. Its head and neck moved, but the rest of it stayed completely still and rigid, kind of like a statue. I studied the buck further and saw its skin was loose and seemed to be just draped over its body. I also started to realize that it was bone thin and I could see its ribs. Its eyes weren't the dark eyes of a deer. They were strangely human and bright yellow. As I grabbed my book bag and prepared to book it out of there, the thing stood up on its hind legs. I know that deer can stand on their back legs to get a better look around, but I do know they can't walk for very long and sure as hell know they can't run like that. It started running at me. I heard an ear-piercing shriek that gives me chills to this day. It sounded like an infant's crying with a grown man's baritone screaming underneath, and it was all distorted. I threw my book bag over my shoulder and started running as fast as I could down the deer trail. I could hear its hoof steps behind me. When I got about halfway down, I turned around to see if it was still following me. It was standing at the edge of the deer trail and just staring at me with those evil, evil eyes. I burned sage and smudged myself in my room as soon as I got home. My room smelled for a week. The next day, Casey was back at school. As we were walking home, she noticed a set of deep deer hoof prints in the dirt next to the deer trail. Kate? She said as she looked from me to the hoof prints and back. What are these? I explained what happened the day before. As I talked, I could see her eyes growing wide. Let's go. She grabbed my hand and pulled me along the tracks. The next time we went there, we brought sage bundles and other cleansing stuff. We haven't seen anything like that again after that. But the fact that something as evil as that thing was in a place of such serenity gives me chills. This has left me feeling extremely shook, and I'd love some opinions, especially from someone with experience. Last year, I had a very strange experience in the National Forest out in California. I was by myself on a road trip with my dog, and I was driving pretty far into the Mendocino National Forest. I like to camp in national parks and forests because it's isolated, so my dog can roam, and they're free of charge. A trade-off for the sketchy rough drives into the park sometimes and the lack of service assistance. Anyway, I was driving up this dirt road, kind of curling up the mountain, maybe around 5 p.m. It was very nice out, sunny and warm with a light breeze. Nothing serious happened, but I felt extremely uncomfortable driving into the area, and that feeling didn't let up. Driving up the mountain, I felt like I shouldn't stay there, and I even texted my boyfriend about it for as long as I could before my phone completely lost service. I was looking around for a sign of another person having been around the area lately, but didn't see anything. I pulled over and got out of my car with my dog and looked over the edge and noticed a dead squirrel and some broken glass mixed in with the dirt and gravel road. Yuka, my dog, starts growling slightly. She's vocal, but I've almost only ever seen her growl at other dogs. I did see her growl at a possum once, so it could be something she smelt, maybe. This place continued to make me feel quite on edge, but I pride myself on being an independent traveler and backpacker, so I decided to continue at least a bit further with my grumbling pup to see if I could find a good place to camp. I continue to notice more dead animals. Keep in mind, no one is going more than 5 or 10 miles an hour up this thing, and that's if there's anyone up there. I hear men's voices. They sound close and I think I should call out to them, so I stop my car but then I kind of freeze up and feel like I shouldn't. I can't really make out what they're asking. 
I don't see any sign of people anywhere, and I get back into my car and continue to slowly drive forward and cautiously look for where the voices could be heard from. I've never ran into other people in the national park or forest when I've gone this deep in. The unsettling feeling grows about the voices, which have sort of come and gone a few times, and I give up and begin to turn my car around. I honestly don't remember how Yuka was acting on the way down. I was scared and focused on getting out of there. I just distinctly remember being surprised at her grumbling when we were standing outside of my car. Kind of dangerously, I quickly went down the mountain and not seeing any sign of anyone. I decided to spring for luxury and get a hotel for the night. I figured I was just fine. Huge and open spaces can be intimidating, I told myself. And the voices could have been echoing from somewhere off in the distance, and they just sounded close. Animals die, glass gets broken, nothing happened. Cool. But I remember this place. It sticks with me. Whenever I'm watching scary movies, if I'm walking my dog in the woods at night, nothing compares to that feeling I had driving up in the mountain, and it's honestly kind of interesting to me, as well as frightening. I recently happened across some information as well as some Native American lore that made me extremely uneasy. Fast forward a year, I mentioned this place to a few people and the haunting vibes it gave me, but nothing much more. I googled the national park once and didn't see anything, but didn't look much either. I like scary movies and things of that nature, hence my fascination in this little event. So my boyfriend and I were coming up on finishing our road trip just yesterday. We were in Wyoming for a wedding. There were only two to three hours left and the sun had to set, so we decided to listen to some scary podcasts and YouTube videos. We went from No Sleep podcast to X-Files and ended up on True Stories video dealing with the Native American lore. I'm half paying attention petting my dog, playing Pokemon on an emulator, and I hear the narrator mention Skinwalkers and Wendigos. Very briefly says what they are and casually mentions they can mimic voices. I mean it when I had the most horrible chills I'd ever had in my life crawl down my spine, and I stare at my boyfriend and ask him if he remembers the National Forest. He says he does and reminds me that he texted me. I was probably close to a skinwalker. He did. I remember him saying that, but I didn't know much about their lore and thought he was just being funny, like, yeah, Bigfoot is probably stalking you, or some other dad joke. And he was like, no. I mean, I was mostly joking, but I said it specifically because you said you were hearing voices that you couldn't find a trace of. I feel strange and I start googling skinwalkers, etc. They are allegedly able to mimic human voices, and they would live in that sort of area. It all matched up. Obviously, there's a ton of questionable information out there, but I tried to find more reputable websites and authentic experiences. I then specifically looked up missing persons in the area, and the first headline that catches my eye is, Another family goes missing in Mendocino. And I went through different websites and news articles of people going missing but they are all a little hidden underneath the national park websites and pictures of trees. I remember looking up the forest about a year ago and didn't see anything and realized these stories didn't seem to be talked about much, which also piqued my intuition. It is also stated that well over a hundred people in the past eight years have gone missing and have not been found, on top of many which are found dead. It just has my intuition super spiked. Remembering how unsafe I felt and how much I wanted to get out of there terrifies me and I felt so uneasy about what I was hearing and do to this day. My dog and I are very close. She was a stray that started following me one day and I ended up bringing her home from Costa Rica. So her little growls along the way makes me feel like there was something wrong. Even though it was just a storytelling video, those stories originate from somewhere. I have done a lot of solo traveling both in and out of the country and I have never had such a bad feeling on top of seeing an unnecessary amount of dead animals in national forests, which just seems strange. I don't think I'll be doing more solo traveling unless it's around civilization. So, I decided to join my best friend Karen for a three-day stay at her grandmother's place on the reservation. Her grandmother lives near a place called Tuba City, Arizona, in the middle of nowhere, but surrounded by secluded homes. We go to college together, and I was kind of interested to know about Navajo tradition. The first day we stayed, it was pretty chill, nothing out of the ordinary. But then her grandma, not old, around 65, 
said that a stray dog came out of nowhere and wouldn't leave. To me, it acted kind of strange and ugly looking. Black, shaggy coat looked like a mix between a German shepherd and a lamb. That night, we were watching a movie in the living room. We had big windows that looked out into the front where the cars were parked, with the curtains wide open. Grandma was in the kitchen cooking dinner, and we were watching a movie. Next to the window is a medium bookshelf and where we keep our DVDs. Karen went to put back a DVD we had just watched, but she freaked out because that stray black dog was staring at us through the window, standing on top of the wood box outside. Not something normal dogs do, from my point of view or hers. Usually, my dog, which is a house dog, scratches the door to be let in. Reservation dogs aren't house dogs, and dogs inside houses are frowned upon in Navajo tradition, meant to protect the house and the owner. The other dogs seemed to stray away from it. Karen opened the door and yelled at it to get off the box. They ran off behind the shed. We went to Tuba City to get some groceries and came back to the house. The dog was nowhere to be seen, nothing unusual. Grandma went to visit some people, so it was just Karen and I. About five o'clock, we heard someone trying to open the door. We both looked out since there had been no car heard and no dogs barking. We looked out the living room window to the door and there was a dog trying to open the door with its paws. Two paws wrapped around the brass doorknob standing on its hind legs. I thought that was weird, but it didn't really freak me out. Karen was though. She opened the door and chased it off. Grandma came back later, and Karen told her she didn't like what she heard. We got ready to sleep. We slept in the spare room since it had two beds. One of the window curtains opened a little. We turned off the light, but something sounded like it was on top of the roof. Pitter-patter, footsteps and scratching sounds, as well as panting. Weird, because the roof was way up there. It sounded like it jumped off onto a large plastic water barrel that they had. At first, we heard what sounded like barking, but as it grew louder, the dog seemed to be barking at something else. But all of a sudden, something was running around the house, barking, and it was no dog. No, it wasn't. The barking sounded human, a deep male voice barking like it knew that we knew it wasn't a dog. Woof, 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 rough, rough, arf, arf. Just exactly like that, adding the W's, R's, and A's. Then panting again by the window, then we started freaking out. Karen decided to open the curtains to look out, in my opinion, that was stupid. There was a stray dog on its hind legs looking into our bedroom, but this time it stunk. And what I thought were two black holes in the neck. Another pair of eyes twinkled. Think of those ugly, glossy spider eyes staring at you. And the paws were deformed, looking like hands and overgrown, somewhat thick, sharp fingernails. Again, both screaming and shutting the curtains closed. Grandma came running through the door and seeing it, first thing she did was grab ashes from the fireplace, loaded three bullets into a shotgun from under her bed, blessed herself in Navajo and went outside to shoot it, yelling in Navajo about how the thing wasn't welcomed here and how it should get the hell out and for it to go linger somewhere else. Them both being traditional, the next day they called a medicine man to come over and put cedar in the house. He prayed over everyone with cedar smoke and eagle feather, blessed the place, and made us eat bitter herbs 
called Eagle's Go or something and gave me an old arrowhead. Apparently, I needed to carry one for protection in a little pouch called a corn pullman. Seems to work pretty well. The medicine man said the dog was a skinwalker, which in Navajo is a long word, but I just call them Yoshis. The body of a stray dog, which was killed by the skinwalker, made an illusion, so he wouldn't know that it wasn't a real dog. He also said that skinwalkers tend to harm people by using some sort of human bone straw to spit at someone and get human bones into them. Doctors can't detect it, but the medicine man that day pulled a piece of the human skull out of my grandma's right shoulder, pretty big, about two inches long and one centimeter thick. It was real because we watched him pull it out of her. That was intense. It's been six days and my world has changed entirely. I guess anything can be possible now. Like if I saw a unicorn fighting a werewolf tomorrow, I wouldn't be shocked after everything came to head six days ago. I'm 17 years old and it's summer vacation. I won't say where I live, but it's in the north of the US. I have a sister who's 15. We're very close. We live a bit off the beaten path. Town and school are a good 20 minute drive from where we live in the woods. We have no neighbors out here. We never thought anything of it until recent years when we'd want to hang out with our friends. But town is so far off. I guess that's why we're so close. We've always been kind of isolated from other kids. But we grew up in this old house with our mom and dad. So we never knew any other way. Our family is, was, our family was pretty solid and stable. The only thing that ever caused any issue was my mom. My mother had schizophrenia. This usually wasn't an issue because she took her meds, but every few years she'd skip a dose or just stop taking them. She would get weird, mean, paranoid, delusional, and scared more than anything. Since my dad owned a business, he was at work. As my sister and I were left with an authority figure whose perception was way off, she would just arbitrate rules and punishments for us based on events that she believed to happen. During one bad event, I feel like I was grounded for a year for doing things I'd never done. It would go on like that until she got bad enough that the police had to be involved. Usually because she'd run away, get lost in the woods, and she'd be involuntarily committed, stabilized, and come back as our kind, wonderful mom again. Anyway, my sister and I were enjoying our summer break, staying up late, goofing off in the woods, and something new. I could drive now. And I'd saved up money, and my dad helped me buy a cheap used car. It was 13 years old, but it was in good shape. It had been owned by an elderly couple who didn't use it much. So, my sister and I had the freedom to independently drive into town, go to the mall, meet up with friends. I'm sad to say, what started as the best summer ever looks like it stopped abruptly as it started, and there's no going back. My sister and I decided one afternoon to meet some of our friends from school in town for lunch and spent the rest of the afternoon at the lake. Mom had been acting a little strange, and we'd wondered if she stopped taking her meds. She just seemed a little bit more scared than usual, which is generally the start. But none of us wanted to hurt her feelings by asking just yet. She told us to be home by dark, and we were. I guess Dad was working late, because he wasn't home. Mom's SUV was in the driveway, but all the lights were off in the house. When we went inside, my sister announced, Hey Mom, we're home. But mom wasn't there. We looked in her parents' room, our rooms, then the rest of the house. We started to look in the yard, and we heard her voice further out in the woods, but we couldn't make out what she was saying. We didn't stop to think. My sister turned the flashlight on her phone on, and we started out into the woods. This was our mother. If she was lost out there, she could get hurt. And there was the concern because of her frightened behavior and her mental health history. We walked quickly for about 15 minutes into the woods, and we realized we were going further in a direction we'd never been. All of it was unfamiliar, outside of the little trails and familiarity of what was nearby. Our home was nestled between a human street and wilderness, what my dad called the deep woods. While he was leery of us getting too far into the deep woods in general, he specifically forbade us to never be caught out there after the sun was down. We were both realizing this when we heard what sounded like our mother's scream and animal growls. 
We didn't say a word, but blindly rushed through the trees, dodging twisted roots and thorny vines in the direction of the noises. We came to a stop in a little clearing. The trees were thick on all sides. The sky was visible, but dark. No bright moon out to illuminate. We heard rustling in the nearby brush, and my sister wheeled around with her flashlight, looking for the source. We saw branches of trees and bushes quivering, as if we were surrounded, but we saw nothing. We heard our mom's voice again, which was disturbing. Her tone was conversational, and we could hear it well enough, but the words or sounds didn't make much sense. Then it stopped. Everything went silent. Everything stopped moving. That's when the smell hit us. The scent of decay. Something had crawled somewhere to die and be discovered days later by the scent. What is that smell? I asked my sister in a whisper. She was about to respond, but my scream cut her off. While she was looking at me, something stumbled into the beam of her light. Something with red, reflective eyes. And she totally went still and silent. I did too. As we tried to make out what this thing was in front of us. It looked like a buck, standing on its hind legs. But it was all wrong. It stood about eight feet tall. Then the more we looked at it, the more wrong it was. Its head was in profile now. The red eyes had been replaced by black, empty sockets, and I realized its head was a skull with bits of flesh and fur barely hanging on. It looked more like a canine skull. Its jaws seemed to turn up in a sinister grin. From its torso, it had two arms, ending in almost human hands, but with deadly claws. Instead of hooves of a deer, its legs looked more like those of a bear. It was covered in blood, and here and there, the flesh was gone, and the skeleton was visible beneath. It turned back to face us, defying everything natural. As its head turned, the face and the rest of the creature went black, like a shadow. In spite of the light shining on it, it looked like a silhouette, and then some red eyes opened, and we could see the yellow fangs grinning, like a man's face. It looked like it was laughing, but then it began screaming. It was somewhere between a human and an animal's cry. The antlers had begun to change, wriggling like snakes. Then the thing took a jerky step toward us, then another, then another. As this thing started running on its hind legs, our fear paralysis broke, and my sister and I both broke into a run. She was ahead of me with a flashlight. I was behind her, and I'll admit, I had tears streaming down my face in pure terror. Even though we have never been that far out, we seemed to be heading in the right direction. We could see the lights from the house. Had we left that many lights on? Dad must be home. I didn't look back, for fear that thing would be there, and pounce, or whatever it would do. Then I heard my mom's voice. Psst. That made me stop. I turned to look. My sister ran a bit more, then realized I'd stopped. Come on, are you crazy? Let's go. But I had heard my mom. I swore I could see her, through the darkness, peeking out from behind a tree, beckoning me to come back. And I almost did. My sister grabbed my arm and pulled me back onto the trail, and we didn't stop running until we were at the front door, which was open. We hadn't left the front door open, so this was strange. We took a minute to investigate. My dad's truck was in the driveway, but not parked like he normally does. The doors of the truck were open. As we walked into the house, we saw dark tracks leading in on the hardwood, like those of a dog, or in some places, a bear. These tracks looked like mud, but became bloody. We followed them through the living room to the kitchen. We swung open the door to find our mom, pushing a mop, decidedly cleaning up the mess. We were so relieved. I think I approached her to give her a hug, but my sister grabbed my hand and stopped me. She wasn't mopping right away. I don't know how to describe it. She was just kind of raking the mop back and forth in a jerky motion, and the mop bucket wasn't out. So she was just using a wet mop to move dirty water back and forth across the floor. She actually wasn't standing the right way either. Her head was facing down, but rolled off awkwardly to one side. Her legs positioned in odd angles where she stood. She stood up at us for a minute. I almost screamed again. Her eyes were hollow, and her mouth was full of crooked fangs that didn't fit in her mouth. But I blinked, and she looked normal, except the face. I don't know how to describe it. Her eyes didn't shine like they normally did, and in spite of a definite grin, her face seemed flat. Hi guys, how was your day? She asked, pronouncing some words strangely, in a bit of a staccato. Good, where's dad? My sister asked. Dad? 
is gone, she said, cryptically, although a bit more natural. He's been having an affair. He decided to leave us, with no emotion in her voice. Normally, this would be a huge shock, but I think we were both so overwhelmed with fright, as it was. We just left the kitchen, without a word, walked straight upstairs to my room, and locked the door. We just sat in silence for a while. Then my sister asked, What do we do? I don't know. That isn't mom. That's the thing from the woods. The walking deer thing. What are you talking about? Apparently, my sister had seen a wolf the size of a horse, but where the tail end should be was another wolf. She said she saw it go all shadowy and transform into a giant figure with human-like features and the writhing antlers too before it began to chase us. Skinwalker, my sister said. I felt like this quickened some memories in me. We had always been fond of spooky stories and supernatural sort of things. From what I remembered, a skinwalker was a southwestern story, a Navajo witch who can change shape to do wicked things, like the Navajo version of a werewolf. I mean, after what I've seen now, I certainly don't doubt this. We were in the north, though. The native legends and lore surrounding us spoke about a creature, or god, called the Wendigo. I couldn't remember the term at the time, so I think I called it the Dead God. I was trying to remember. There was different tales about the Wendigo, most often a giant emaciated corpse with antlers and fangs, like a Frankenstein monster made of animals. Some stories say the Wendigo was cursed for committing cannibalism and transformed into a flesh-eating monster, while another story, a friend of mine, whose culture takes these things seriously, told me in a hushed tone that the Wendigo was the god of the deep woods and the god of death. Its spiritual touch could turn men into cannibals and would raise the dead, making host bodies of animal carcasses, but possessed human bodies when it could, to spread its influence. After I explained this, I think we both silently accepted this as a possibility. What if mom wasn't sick all these years? What if it was the Wendigo's influence over her, trying to get to the only human family in the area? We didn't have a lot of time with our thoughts because there were crashing sounds from the kitchen, pots and pans, dishes breaking, and an instant later, a pounding at the door. It's like this thing knew our thoughts, and it knew we weren't fooled that it was in mom's body. Our little mom, who was about 5 feet tall and 115 pounds with blonde-like hair and big blue eyes. She always looked so sweet, like a doll. It was unsettling to think that something so sinister might have gotten to her, and maybe dad too. Where was he? The pounding on the door stopped. The imitation of our mother's voice was more convincing now, as if by me thinking of her gave the thing more knowledge. Hey guys, open up. I want to talk. About dad. Clearly, this is traumatic. She sounded so kind and so sympathetic. My sister is a tough girl though. She screamed, stay away from us. Silence. Then a growl. Then the pounding on the door resumed. It was so forceful though, the door was going to break for sure. Before we knew what to do, a bone white antler stabbed right through the door, showering splinters and creating several large holes. Through the cracks, I saw a brief, broken vision of a buck's head and a wolf's jaws, covered in rotten flesh, but through another, it appeared to be totally skeletal. It laughed, or made a noise, like a deep creepy laughter. <laughs> That's when we jumped off my bed. It started ramming its antlers into the door, breaking in, but we were already out the window, climbing down the lattice that my mom grew jasmine on. We heard the thing break through the door. Looking up, I saw its enormous, terrifying silhouette with huge antlers, the hole totally obscured and black, except its glowing red eyes. I had my car key still in my pocket. We jumped in my car, and I started her up. I began speeding out in such a hurry, my sister had to cry out, turn the lights on. I did, but wish I hadn't. This was taking place over seconds. We had just seen the thing upstairs, and I had to slam on my brakes as my mom, or whatever was in my mother, came limping out in front of the car. It was literally dragging its feet behind it. It didn't know how to use the body properly. Then it stopped. Blank face. Empty holes for eyes. It raised my mother's hands, trying to signal us to stop. My sister urged me on. What are you waiting for? That's still mom. No, it isn't. Either get around it or run it down. I wasn't sure how I felt about any of that until what I saw. In the headlights now, I could better see dad's truck. 
Hanging out of the open front door was what was left of my father, covered in blood in his tattered work clothes. His forearms and hands were intact, but that's all I could see. I was filled with immediate sorrow and fear. Then, a blind rage took over, and I screamed. I slammed my foot against the gas and plowed into the shape of my mother. It flopped like a rag doll over the hood, then clung to the windshield. It looked at us with red, glowing eyes for a moment. Then the eyes went dark. As her back split open, a dark shadowy figure jumped out, vanishing into the woods in a single leap. Then the body went flat, like a popped balloon or an empty snakeskin. It seemed to just blow away, too. We drove to the police station in town. Neither of us spoke the way there. My sister hasn't spoken since, or so I'm told. She's in the mental health ward of the hospital. They've asked me vague questions and treated me physically. I'm fine. But from what I understand, there's a lengthy investigation going on. I guess the house and some of the woods caught fire from a flash lightning storm sometime after we left. I'm just now able to access a computer, so I thought I'd write this all down and try to get it out there before the doctors and the police start making me answer questions and try to lock me up too. My whole life that I've known is gone. Nothing will ever be the same. I just want people to know what really happened before they say I've lost my mind. If anyone can offer help or advice, I don't know if I'll get it in time, but please, help me. I live in a partially suburban area in Ohio. There is a small wooded area with a creek next to my family's property. I'm 16 years old, and sometimes I like to go down there and catch things like crayfish and minnows. I have a room in the upstairs of my house, but it gets really hot in the summer, and I do not have air conditioning, so I instead sleep in the basement, which is a lot cooler. There is also a PS4 down there, so I can stay up late watching movies and playing games. In the basement, there was a very large window, and it is right next to the couch where I sleep. It all started one night, when I heard strange howls that sounded a lot closer to my house than usual. At first, it didn't scare me, because I often hear coyotes howling at night, and I just figured that there was one a little closer to my house than usual. Big deal. However, there was something off-putting about each howl. First of all, it didn't sound like a coyote which have very high-pitched howls, and usually there are multiple coyotes howling at the same time. The howl that I was hearing was very low-pitched and went on for probably about 15 seconds at a time. I still brushed it off and I figured it was a large coyote that was maybe lonely. These howls went on for a few more nights, and one thing that confused me is that I stopped hearing the occasional regular coyote howl. Instead, every night, there was just this howl. Remember, I had mentioned that this howl sounded closer to my house than normal, but that wasn't always the case. In fact, the howl seemed to change in volume every few minutes, like the coyote was moving while it howled. I did not see how it was possible, but the coyote was either moving at an impossible speed, howling at different points in the forest, or maybe there were multiple, but the howl didn't even sound like a coyote to begin with. So I just assumed that maybe an odd family of coyotes moved into the forest and scared all of the regular ones away. Some nights, the howl sounded close to my house, and then in the next minute, it sounded far away. This made me feel a little bit uneasy, but I just ignored it. So, I woke up in the morning and did my usual routine of feeding my chickens, practicing driving, and going for a swim in my pond. Then, once night came, I went down into the basement to watch Thor Ragnarok. Then, right about the time when Thor was fighting the Hulk in the arena, I heard one light tap on my window. This instantly broke me out of my investment into the movie and made my heart jump into my throat. I have always been a paranoid person. At first, I just laid there, not able to move, and then once it had been a while, I relaxed and decided it was probably just a bird or something. But then, abruptly, I heard another tap at the window, and at this point, I had reasoned that it was a bird, so I didn't feel scared of moving the curtains to see if there was a bird sitting there, stunned. When I opened the curtains, I immediately wished I had been more paranoid. What I saw was not a bird. It was a face. A terrifying, disfigured human face. I only looked at it for about two seconds before I ran upstairs to wake my parents, but I will try to describe it the best I can. Its face was longer than any person's face I had ever seen. It had no lips, and its teeth were yellow and so pointy. 
It looked like someone took sandpaper and did their best to carve spear points for their teeth. Its nose was gone and had no eyes, only sockets filled with blackness. And the most disturbing part was that the whole face looked like it was decaying. When I woke my parents, my dad agreed to come with me down to the basement to see what was there. But when he went down there, the creature was gone. Needless to say, my dad didn't believe me and just said that if I was scared, I could just go upstairs to my room to sleep. That is exactly what I did. I didn't care if my room was hot. I just wanted to feel safe. So I went into my room. I locked all my windows and locked the door. Then I went onto the internet to see if anyone else had any encounters like this. It turns out that what I think I saw was something called a skinwalker. And it started to make sense since skinwalkers can shapeshift and turn into animals they kill. That would explain why the face looked like it was decaying. But then it hit me. This skinwalker had the decaying face of a human on it. I have never seen the creature again, and I hope I never do, but it still terrifies me to this day. Why was this skinwalker at my window, and who did it kill to get that face? This story recollects what happened during the Navajo Nation Fair season of 2015. My roommate and her boyfriend decided to head back to the reservation to take part in the festivities, rodeo, parade, and carnival. My roommate was the offspring of divorced parents and spent her teenage years half on the reservation in Window Rock, Arizona with her mother and half with her father in Phoenix. She was raised as a devout Catholic, even attending Catholic school. Nothing paranormal had ever occurred in her life up until this point. Her boyfriend was an urban Navajo who was a Christian, having been born and raised off the reservation in Phoenix, Arizona. I am declarifying their religious ideologies and affiliations because neither of them believed in Navajo traditionalism or ghost stories. Late one evening, after both of them got off work, they decided to head out to make the most of their three-day weekend. My roommate made prior accommodations with a good friend from high school. When my roommate was a young adult, her mother decided to move away from the res. If her mother still lived in Window Rock, she would have simply stayed there. The accommodations were as follows. Her good friend opted to stay close to relatives and offered her a two-bedroom, two-bath manufactured home at her disposal. The trailer was located off the road between St. Michael's and the first four-way intersection when you are heading towards Window Rock from Summit. Many have called it the back road to St. Michael's the old, original township of St. Michael's, that is. As you can imagine, they arrived to their Navajo Fair b, b pretty late. The trailer was off to the right of the main highway and was situated at the foot of a large rolling hill. There was no streetlights. First order of business, my roommate calls her friend to let her know they arrived safely. They walk up to the trailer and unlock the door and give themselves a tour of their accommodations. They turned on all the lights in every room they toured my roommate had driven the entirety of the journey home, so she was a bit more fatigued than her partner. She asked him to get the luggage from the car. It was a hatchback. The car was parked about 40 feet away. She explained to me that it had rained some weeks before and the dirt road leading up to the house was wrecked. To avoid bottoming out, she parked on level ground. She walks into the guest room and her boyfriend is already laid out on the bed. She pleads with him to go get the luggage and most importantly her makeup bag so she can remove her makeup before bed. She compromises with them that she'll go out with him if he does the heavy lifting. She doesn't want to put her heels back on, so she decides to watch him from the porch. Yes, heels. She worked at a bank and always had to dress professionally, in a pantsuit and heels. So she is standing on the top stair of the small three-stair porch, with the front door slightly ajar, her hand on the doorknob. Her boyfriend walks off into the pitch black, the light from his phone serves as the only beacon of light, signaling his location. As she watches his light grow dimmer and smaller in the distance, she hears what seems to be a pack of dogs howling and barking. She said it sounded like a rumble, a pack of feral dogs or coyotes fighting. The pack of dogs come barreling down the large hill behind the trailer. She hears a loud thud against the back wall of the trailer. The thud was so loud that she heard the rattling of picture frames that were hanging. At this point, fear begins to creep in her mind. She calls out to her boyfriend and hears no response. She shouts for him once again. That's when she realizes the dogs have all gone silent, all at once in a fluid succession of motions. She said that something from inside her trailer slams the front door. 
so fast that it creates a gust of wind. She said that if she had been holding onto the doorknob, it would have knocked her off the landing off the front steps. The porch light flickers and then goes dead. She is standing there barefoot in the darkness. She tries to open the door and retreat back into the trailer. She was able to turn the doorknob until it clicked. The door wasn't locked. Something heavy was pressed up against the flimsy manufactured hollow court door from inside. At this point, she said she didn't realize she was crying at the brink of an anxiety attack. Adrenaline took over her and she began throwing herself and all of her weight against the door. She saw it inch open and the light from inside flooded the doorway for a split second before it slammed shut in retaliation. Fight or flight. She decides to run barefoot into the darkness to find her boyfriend. His account. He leaves his girlfriend at the top of the front door steps as he walks off into the dark with only his phone serving as a flashlight. He's being very careful where he steps because the earth is turned up and twisted and gnarled. Deep ruts and grooves from a vehicle driving in the mud before it hardens into crust. He is afraid he might twist his ankle. He too hears the frenzied howls and barks of the dogs. He turns around to look at where the sounds are coming from. In the distance, he sees the faint light of the porch go off. He rationalizes to himself that the barking dogs frightened his girlfriend and in fear she ran inside and unintentionally turned off the porch light. He continues walking in the direction of the car. He hears the thud of the heavy footsteps behind him, mimicking his own stride, not exactly in tune with his, following a split second after his own thud, almost echoing intentionally. Figuring it might be his frightened girlfriend running out to him, he calls out to her to no avail. He sees a dim flicker in the distance the light from his phone bouncing off the reflectors of the taillights of the car. His body floods with relief. The relief quickly drains to despair. His phone erratically stops working and won't turn on. His heartbeat almost beats out of his chest. How could this be? He wasn't on his phone the entire drive back. It was fully charged. He takes a few urgent pieces towards where the car was before the lights turned off. His palms are sweaty and he swears he could feel his heart pounding through his hands. He desperately reaches into his pockets for his car keys. He begins frantically pressing all of the buttons, the lock, unlock, panic, and open hatchback buttons. Nothing. He even stretches out his hands in the dark as pressing the buttons, thinking that he is on the cusp of the electronic radius of the vehicle to respond. Still nothing. The footsteps behind him hastened and almost sounded like he was going to be charged from the back. He is too terrified to look back. At this point, he realizes the dread that he feels in the pit of his stomach means it's something unnatural. His shoulders drop as he instinctively braces for some sort of impact. The sound of heavy footsteps would indicate that he would have been hit by now. Nothing. The footsteps loudly led directly up to him, to his heels, and nothing. He opens his eyes and hears something like a coin drop and hit the top of his car. He turns around to the patter of bare feet on the dirt road. His girlfriend charges into him, full embrace, hugging him. Mind you, his feet stayed planted. He doesn't take one step forward or back. The car keys are still in his hands. His thumb presses down. A loud click. The familiar sound of the hatchback opening and the lights from inside the car quickly floods their immediate surroundings. They grab their luggage and a pair of flip-flops from the car and slowly make their way back to the trailer. Oddly, the front porch light was on now. My roommate makes her boyfriend go inside and check all of the rooms before she goes back in. He opens the door with ease. He checks each room meticulously. There is no one inside. All of the windows still locked from the inside. I have never retold this account to anyone, but thought I would finally share it before time and life erases the details from my memory. Once in the safety of their trailer, her boyfriend pulled out his cell phone and turned it on to the exact same battery percentage. They corroborate their experiences to recount what happened to each other. Both of them are dumbfounded at the fact that they were shouting at the top of their lungs for each other at one time or another, but neither of them said they heard the others yelling. Growing up on the res, you hear your fair share of skinwalker and ghost stories. But this was the first time I heard one where the perpetrator manipulated electronics to a great extent or even at all. It was also the first case where the perpetrator manipulated sound waves. Both of them swore that they were easily in earshot of each other, but weren't allowed to hear each other's cries. There were no structures or trees between them, obstructing the sound waves. He had heard the pack of dogs, but wasn't allowed to hear her screaming out for him. What also spurred me is that this massive amount of questioning from some Reddit users 
if they exist? Why haven't they been filmed or caught on camera? Skinwalkers are just as modern as you and me. Wicked as much as they may be, they are not stupid to deal with smartphones and technological advances as much as anyone. They walk the world as normal people during the day. This is an experience my mom and dad had that happened in December of 2018. They were coming back from dining out and pulled over in the driveway and parked. The area where they live is moderately wooded in a large plot of land, about 20 acres. They got out of their car and started walking up to the door when they heard a blood-curdling scream coming from only 10 feet away from them. Not only was the scream terrifying, but it was extremely loud. My dad is a state trooper and served in the US Marine Corps, so not much actually scares him. He's the guy to watch a horror movie at 3 a.m. with all the lights off and the curtains open. However, that night, he said he was genuinely terrified. They snapped out of their trance and ran inside. He came back out with his gun and his patrol car and started checking around the area. He shined his spotlight down into the pasture and around the property, but couldn't find anything. The fact that he did this was alarming because he would never pull out a gun if he was joking. I've only ever actually seen him pull out a gun two other times in my life. Only about a week after I came home from college for winter break, I sat on the porch late one evening drinking coffee. It was pretty cold and I was reading a book when I heard something eerie coming from the pasture to the east of my house. It sounded like creaking, but there was no wind blowing, and I know the area clearly, and there wasn't a hanging branch or anything for that matter that would justify the sound. Even though it creeped me out, I refused to think anything of it and brushed it off as strange, but explainable. Thoroughly chilled, I stopped reading my book because of bad lighting and went inside. After a while, I found I forgot my book outside and went out to grab it. This time, I heard a low, poor howl. The only canine creatures that live in this place are coyotes, and when you hear them, it's a mixture of yips and short, pitchy howls. Hearing it and having my fears proved that it was some otherworldly being, I grabbed my book and ran inside. About 20 minutes later, my brother comes home from a friend's house. He walks in and doesn't say anything other than, hey, I tell him about what I experienced. To my surprise, he said he heard the exact same thing just a couple minutes earlier when he was walking inside. The sound had moved from its previous location southwest of my position and was now to the northwest corner of the property. He said the sound was long, deep, but poor or weak, kind of like the one I heard. My brother seemed more spooked with his encounter than I did with mine. He said that the duration was so long and then just sounded very fake, like a poor imitation. After that, there wasn't any more sightings the entire time I was home. It's since been ruled out as a deer, since we have a lot of them, and they don't make strange noises like that. But after reading through Reddit, I feel like this may be a skinwalker issue, or something of the sort. We do live near a spot where Native Americans hold their rituals, and there is a house in our neighborhood that was built on a Native American burial ground, so it wouldn't be a surprise to me that this may be the case. I have experienced other strange sounds and being whistled at in the dark, but no sightings so far.